<laughs> Why can't you be this enthusiastic at my normal lectures? Um, can, I, can I start with a, a little question? This will be the only audience from, uh, participating. Can you raise your hand if you're not a physicist? Oh, right. Okay, so there are a few non-physicists in the audience. That's good, that's good. Uh, um, I won't ask any delicate questions about uh, belief or anything like that. Um, I've tried to keep... Uh, the talk a bit neutral, but I'm sure my own opinions will come out. Uh, we might be able to uh, gather my opinions if you don't know them already. Anyway, so the idea of this talk, uh, these are some thoughts I've had uh, recently about the role that relativity has, the theological implications of relativity. So what effect um, does uh, relativity have to the existence or non-existence and role of God? So... The relationship between God and time and various church fathers have been thinking about this problem for, well, for a very long time. Um, Augustine and Pimbo <coughs> date back to the 4th century. Uh, and he, asked the, uh, he came to the conclusion um, that time only exists within the universe. The universe includes time. And because God created everything, God must have created time. And therefore, God does not exist within time. Um, for God, he says, there's no past, present, or future. There's no past or future, but only an eternal presence. So, God simply exists uh, without being active. Uh, it's not dynamic. God doesn't change. He just exists, but he exists outside our universe. And this was an analogy. He spoke about. He said, "Imagine a man walking along a road. Um, the man on the road only sees the road. Now, because of our perceptions of uh, past and future, you've got to really imagine the man is walking backwards, so that he sees his past but not his future. So you'd imagine the man on the road walking along uh, backwards and trying to avoid things. And then you have a woman on the mountainside who." peers down onto the road. So whereas the man only sees his past and perhaps maybe glimmers of what the future might bring, the woman on the mountainside sees everything. She sees uh, both the man's past and the man's future. And so the, that person on the mountainside, there's no concept of which is the past and which is the future, other than by looking at what the man's doing as he's walking along the road. So that was an image that uh, was around and this idea spawned two different concepts of God, um, which uh, I shall refer to as either uh, deism or theism. Now, a deist is someone who believes in God, or possibly gods, that they created the universe, but does not stick... Uh, does not alter the original plan. So they created the universe and then just basically sat back and watched and let the universe unfold uh, as it is. Now this was a, an idea that sort of gained prevalence, I think, in about the 17th century, so it's a much later idea. A theist, on the other hand, believes that God created the universe but then carried on tinkering, making changes, plays an active role in the universe, responds to prayer, responds to, um, sees that something's not going the way they ori uh, he originally intended, uh, and makes changes. So a couple of quotes from the Bible. This one, uh, in terms of physics, is the, the most interesting, because in Joshua, <coughs> Joshua's... Um, Slaughtering the uh, the what are they called uh, the Adrenons. Um and unfortunately the sun was going down and he couldn't slaughter uh, the Israelites couldn't slaughter quite enough of them so he prayed to God 
and God stopped the sun. Now, of course, you've got to bear in mind that when this was written, they believed the sun went round the earth. Um, so the sun stopped, the moon stopped, until the people had revenge upon their enemies. So, uh, as I say, you can ask about... Uh, this is probably one of the... Short of, short of creation itself, this is probably one of the greatest miracles that God performed, since we can work out the angular momentum of the earth and how much, it's, uh, how much energy would be required to stop the earth. Um, but certainly, uh, such a God is prepared to suspend the laws of physics uh, if he has to. And for this to happen, God must be in time. And the idea that he must be living in the same moment as we are. Because otherwise, what concept would there be of asking God to perform such a miracle if God was outside of time? I'm not going to read all this quote. Uh, this is from Jonah. Jonah, of course, was swallowed by a whale because he wouldn't do what God said, which was preach. Um, preach to the people, I can't remember, some, some place, Nevena. Preach to the people of Nevena and tell them to turn from their wicked ways. Uh, he then relented and went to Nevena, and uh, all the people of Nevena then turned away from their wicked ways. And God was very pleased with this and decided that he would not um, uh, that he, he would not uh, inflict the disaster that he said that he would bring upon them. So he decided to inflict a dis uh, disaster on the people of Nevena, and then he changed his mind. So we've got a God that's capable of changing his mind. And such a God also must live in time. He can't be outside of time. Because how could such a, a God change his mind if, uh, if you don't have a time with which to... Um, to do that. So, certainly, the Bible, uh, the, the standard reading of the Bible would suggest that God was within time. So, uh, a quick um, recap. The deist view is that God created time and the universe. The theist, well, the traditional theist would say that time already existed as a concept, but God created the universe within it. And an alternative view, apparently it's quite popular, is that God actually created time and the universe. You can imagine God creating the Big Bang and everything, and, and time uh, is, was created at the same time, same moment, same event as the Big Bang, but then places himself within the universe. So he sort of restricts himself to uh, to be part of the universe uh, and to exist in time. Now, to give you an idea of how our concept of God has changed, physics, science, has played a major role in, if you like, theology. I mean, we often think of physics as being opposed to theology, as them being quite um, sort of fighting against it. But, in fact, um, religion has an awful lot to thank physics for. If you think about the gods, say, of, uh, a few thousand years ago, they were small gods. They were gods over the village, or over the city, or over the, um, over the country. Uh, so here's a, a very small god, Zeus, supposed to be a picture of Zeus, looking down on the, uh, the battle in Troy. And God was actually tricked by uh, Hyp uh, Hypnos, the god of sleep, um, to fall asleep because uh, Hypnos wants to, the battle to go one way. Um, uh, Zeus then wakes up, uh, looks down with his all powerful eye, and sees instantly what's happening between the Greeks and the Romans and decides that that's not the way he wants the battle to go. But such a god really was only the god of. Uh, the Greeks and possibly a few surrounding areas. There was no concept of um, God being bigger than that. But as our knowledge of the universe, so we had knowledge of the world, um, and then uh, we increased and said, okay, the solar system, and then uh, galaxy, and then finally the universe, um, as our knowledge of uh, 
uh, the, the universe has increased. So the power of our God has also increased. And so now we have a God that's not only God over billions of galaxies, uh, well, it's not, it's over the whole universe, which consists of billions of galaxies and billions of stars. So we actually, <coughs> we've taught, if you like, the physicists have taught the uh, uh, religion about how big God is. The religious people initially were just happy that God was bigger than their temple, bigger than their city, whereas now we say, well, it has to be, he has to be bigger than the entire universe. Okay, so we'll go back to the idea of um, Newtonian mechanics and time. Okay, most of you are doing physics, you know about Newtonian mechanics. Now, in Newtonian mechanics, time is just a single line. Okay, you have, at some point on that time, you have now. Points before it are called the past, points beyond it are called the future. And the time is the same in all points in the universe. I'm not referring to you know, different time zones and such, but this idea that the time that I am experiencing now is the same as the time that has been experienced on, say, Alpha Centauri uh, two, three light years away, four light years away, whatever it is. So this is easy for theism. For theists, they'll say, well, since we're all experiencing the same time, then surely God's time must be the same as our time. And you can imagine this as being, at each moment in time, God sees the entire universe. So it's like he's turning the pages of a book, maybe making changes if necessary. But that's fine if in Newtonian mechanics. But then a very clever person came along, Einstein came along and said, well, hold on a minute, this is wrong. Various experiments aren't consistent with this, and we need a new theory, which is uh, relativity, which you've all heard, and some of you have done courses in that. Now, Einstein's theory of relativity, both special and general, says that space and time are combined into a single entity called space-time. And within this entity, uh, the speed of light, at least in a vacuum, is the same for everyone. So this is the standard theory. This is not really a hypothesis that if you don't like, you can just say, oh, I don't like it, I'm just going to ignore it. This is basically um, how we look at the universe today. Uh, it's been extremely well tested. Uh, so many experiments that uh, use the theory of relativity. This is uh, a particle accelerator uh, called ALICE. That's in a place called Cockroach Institute where I work with an advert. Um, as particles uh, are given more and more energy, they increase in speed, but they certainly never go faster than the speed of light. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's programmed in that, that basically these particle accelerators wouldn't work. This is a GPS, and despite their problems, uh, they're very accurate, and they do tell you where you are, and in order to tell you where they are, they actually have to incorporate the equations of general relativity um, to get the correction. Okay, it's not a big effect, but uh, it's certainly a few hundred meters. So, so we actually have to put in GR uh, into these, uh, program into these uh, devices to get them accurate. And of course, everyone knows about E equals MC squared. Uh, nobody doubts that, and that had catastrophic consequences uh, during the Second World War and since. Of course, we now have an expert in the audience about this. Um, what about neutrinos? Who's heard about the neutrino problem, the supernumerary neutrinos getting far from the speed of light? Uh, well, I don't know the answer to that any more than anyone else does. Uh, the, the data. Nobody believes that they go faster than light. No scientist believes that they go faster than light. If you're pinning your hopes on uh, being able to refute everything I say because neutrinos go faster than light, you're surely going to be disappointed because 
almost certainly, and everyone expects it to happen, we're going to find the faults in the, problem, in the uh, experiment and explain why they don't go faster than light. But you never know, there might be an amazing new theory out there that explains why they do. Okay, so before we can talk about uh, space-time, this combination of space and time, we need to talk about dimensions. Now, hopefully everyone who's a physicist in the room will know about this, uh, but for those people who aren't, it's a uh, very brief uh, synopsis. We say that space, the space that we live in, is three-dimensional, because we need three numbers to specify a point in space. Now, thanks to Jake for this one. Uh, <laughs> When you play battleships, everyone's played battleships, I hope, okay, you need two numbers, or a number and a letter, to specify a point in the game. Okay, and you remember you'd say, you know, you'd say something like uh, 6B or something, and uh, you'd go along to 6 and then up to B, and then you'd go, sorry, nothing, and so on. So you need two numbers, the distance east, often represented by the letter X, followed by the distance north. Um, and why do we need two numbers? Because the game of battleships is played on a two-dimensional surface, the surface of the sea. Okay, nothing, you wouldn't put your battleship above the sea or below the sea. Um, although, it would be a way of winning, because after they scan the entire board, and they say, no, you didn't point any, say, oh yes, I did, I put them above the board. And no one would play with you then. Of course, I want to paint in this one. You could play battle subs which is three-dimensional uh, battleships, okay? Uh, well, submarines not only have uh, the X and Y, uh, so the, the two-dimensional, where they are north and east, if you like, but they have the height and the, uh, the ocean where they are. And so you could imagine setting up a game of battle submarines, in which case you would need uh, three numbers, X, Y, and Z, or uh, east, north, and height, to specify the position. Do you think that would be a fun game? <laughs> I think the problem is, if you, if you work out how many spaces are actually filled by submarines, it's actually be a very dull game. Unless you had a lot of submarines. Okay, so let's look at space-time. So we already established that space has three dimensions, now we're going to incorporate time as well, we'll do that by adding another dimension, so we have a four-dimensional object, and such as four-dimensional objects, of course you need four numbers to specify a point in it. Now a point in uh, space-time is called an event, to distinguish it from a point in space, and it needs uh, four numbers, it needs three numbers to give the, uh, the position in space, and an extra number to tell you the time that it happened. So, for example, here's a, a very important uh, event in my life. Bromley Hospital. Uh, so those are the coordinates of Bromley Hospital. Okay, I don't know if I was born on the third floor. I've made that bit up. Uh, but let's pretend I was born on the third floor. It might have actually been a very important life in somebody else's life. Uh, and... So this, here are three numbers that specify the position in space. And then we need one additional number, uh, which is the 1st of May, midnight 1st of May, 1968, uh, which was in a minute or so of the time I was born. So obviously, that's a very important time in my life. Of course, I only have two dimensions uh, to draw on, or possibly three if I do some, uh, some clever projecting. Uh, so I'm not, I won't draw, draw all dimensions on my space-time diagram simply because I haven't got a four-dimensional board. Uh, if I did, it would look wonderful. Uh, so if someone, clever person, can go away and invent one of those, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so, space and time have the same footing in special relativity. So here's a, a, a nice space-time diagram. And it's the world line of a uh, pupil called Bob. Uh, his home is schooled about four kilometers away. Um, he leaves his home one day at seven at 8.30, so he's at his home, so that's just that straight line. So notice that 
person who occupies a point, at least a small volume of space, becomes a line on a space-time diagram. Because, um, because at each time, if you like, uh, there's a corresponding point in space. And traditionally, we put the time uh, at the y-axis and space. So he's at home until 8.30. He then travels to school. So not only is he traveling along the x-axis to school, but he's also traveling in time. Okay, it's not an instantaneous thing. Uh, so he goes along this line. He then stays at school. He's really lazy. He arrives late at school and then only stays until midday uh, and then goes home and watches TV at home. So, uh, so he's a particularly lazy day, uh, lazy kid, but he does, even lazy people have timelines, uh, have world lines. So this is called the world line of Bob. Okay, now, to make life easy, one of the things is that special relativity says that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. And rather than having distance in kilometers along the bottom or meters and time in seconds, we have time in seconds, but distance in light seconds. And light second is, what is it, 300,000 kilometers, something like that. So one unit there is 300,000 kilometers, okay? Which makes the diagram that I drew on the previous look rather dull because it would just be indistinguishable, basically, from this line, okay? But when you want to do things relativistically, um, this is the easiest because this means that light always travels one light second per second. So it always travels along this 45 degree line. Now, every massive object, so every real object, will travel at a speed slower than the speed of light. So if this red line here is a permitted uh, path because it never travels faster than the speed of light. By contrast, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Well, neutrino is excluded. Um, so this blue line here is a forbidden path. You can't travel along this, because that would require going faster than the speed of light. Now, any event then divides space-time into three bits, three regions. Every point, so this point here you imagine is my, my birth. All the points that are influenced by my birth, plus my existence, must lie within this triangle. Because I can't travel faster than the speed of light, and no signal that I produce can travel faster than the speed of light. So my, my birth and all the events that happen are in any way affected by my birth, such as you listening to me in a lecture hall, must occur within this triangle. Likewise, all the events that led up to my birth, or somehow influenced my birth, for example, my parents meeting, must lie within this triangle. And then there's a region that's outside. That consists of points that can't be influenced by my birth. <coughs> my birth can't influence. Because any point here, to get to there, the signal must travel faster than the speed of light. I mean, no, that doesn't happen. Of course, space-time is uh, four-dimensional. I don't have four dimensions, but I can sort of draw it in, uh, in three dimensions. And then, in that case, this cone, this triangle actually becomes a cone. So it's called the light cone. Okay, and you have a cone which represents the future and another cone that represents the past. So what are, going back to the theological implications, well, we said in Newtonian mechanics, God's time was the same as our time. Now in special relativity, there is a notion of now. That is, all the points which are at the same time as the, uh, this observer, okay? Um, and that's drawn by this axis here. So all these points, and now, which I put in red, are all the points that are at the same time as uh, this point here is for this observer. But there's a problem, and this is where it gets interesting. The now 
depends on your motion. So, this, this observer here has the now along here. The set of points here, as far as this observer is concerned, are all the same time, all occur at the same time, all these events occur at the same time. But for observer 2, who's moving relative to observer 1, the now for observer 2 is different. It's a different set of points. Uh, and this is a kind of rotation. You'll see more of this. Uh, you can think of this, you can think of the now as if I'm traveling a, in a straight line. Actually, I'm going to do a demonstration here. It's got a bit of time. <coughs> Go on. You know you want to. Now, my now is what, when I look left and right, are the things parallel to me. Francis is going to walk at an angle, so if you turn and walk sort of that way, okay, now we'll both take a couple of steps, okay, now my now is that line there, Francis's now, you draw, okay, is different, okay, that's equivalent, it's a rotation, thank you very much, round of applause for my glamorous assistant. Um, the now is different, so it's a kind of rotation, but because time is different from space, it's not like a usual rotation, it uh, actually has a name, uh, but it's a slightly strange, strange rotation, and it's a rotation that's necessary such that the speed of light, this light cone, remains the same. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, theological implications of this. Now, uh, in Newtonian mechanics, it was easy. God's time was the same as our time. Everybody's time was the same, was the same as God's time. But in relativity, there's a problem. If God is in time, he must choose a time in which he's in. He could choose any of these lines and say, ah, that's my time. That's a time at which I observe the universe. So you could choose this one, or this one, or this one, and they're all different. Now, of course, God could choose any time, being omnipotent, he could choose any time he wished to choose. But, and this is, if you like, simply my opinion, if God chose a specific time, we should be able to see that. We should be able to observe which should have some effect on the universe that God was choosing these slices. Okay? And we certainly don't detect anything. Everything we detect says it's independent of the time that God chose. Well, surely there's an easy solution. Okay? We're special to God. The planet Earth is special to God because he chose us to make his re revelations and all, all such. Uh, could he not simply pick our time, the time, if you like, in uh, the simultaneous time associated with us. Uh, so that's at all the points that we consider to be at the same time as our time. But the Earth moves. Half the year it's moving in one direction, and then the other half of the year it's moving in the other direction. And it keeps changing direction. Now I don't have, and I could have done this on three dimensions, but it would have looked awful. So just imagined it in, uh, uh, as a wiggly line. So in June 2012, we're moving in this direction, and as a result, that's the now corresponding to uh, sorry, January 2012. At a later time, June 2012, it's moved, uh, the planet's moving in the opposite direction, so the now line has changed its angle. Well, that's fine, unless you live out here at a distant planet. And I worked out it's about three billion light years away. Uh, so it's actually quite near the edge of the universe, but it is within the edge of the universe. There's a planet in which our now time is moving backwards. Okay, so even though we are, uh, yeah, so even though, uh, uh, we're moving forward in time. 
at the distant planet it's moving backwards in time. Has anyone ever driven and then watched an aeroplane from their car? And you know the aeroplane's moving faster than you are, but because you're turning slowly, it looks like the aeroplane's moving backwards. It's the same effect. It's an artificial effect. It's just due to the way you're looking. Okay? But it's the same effect as this one. Now, general relativity includes uh, gravity. Okay, bias, <coughs> my particular bias here, I consider it to be the most beautiful theory in physics. Uh, but unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, since I like maths, uh, it does require a little bit of maths. Um, to give you an idea, special relativity is taught in the first and second year undergraduates. General relativity isn't really taught until the fourth year here, so um, gives you an idea of how much tougher it is. General relativity says that massive objects create gravitational fields which deform um, space-time, and as everybody knows, it describes wonderful objects like the Big Bang and black holes. Uh, this picture here is an artist's impression of what the plasma around the black hole what it's supposed to do. Nobody really knows, but we can observe. We know that there is plasma around the black hole because we've heard, we've seen pulsars, we've seen the effects of uh, these, this, this plasma around the black hole, and it's really fascinating, so we, we try to understand what's going on. Uh, purely mathematically, this is actually a map, space-time map of a black hole. Uh, and for a little advert here, for those people who are intending to do 484, uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> you will get to, to, not only will you get to see these, but you'll actually derive them in glorious, painful detail. Um, so, what can we say about God's time? Well, now the, now the problem is even worse. The now, that is the plane of points that we consider to be simultaneous, uh, doesn't exist at all. Not even uh, for one person. If there's a star with a massive object in between, there can be several nows. And I found this on the internet. It's called Einstein's Cross. What it is, is a very distant galaxy um, a long way away. And in between the galaxy and us, there's a heavy object, another uh, big galaxy. And that's actually produced four images. So I will use this, this pen after all. You can imagine, here's the the distant galaxy, here's us observing it, and in between there's some heavy object, it could be a black hole, it could be a, uh, another galaxy, and what's happened is it's bent the light several different ways, okay, so you get multiple images, because the light that's bent that way, when we look at it we think that light's travelled in a straight line, so we're we're not going to see this galaxy from here. We're going to think we think that it comes. So we're going to see an image here, uh, and we're going to see another image down here. Uh, in this case, we see four images. We know that they're exactly the same galaxy. It's not four galaxies. Yes. Why is four one of a ring? Well, that's due. We're going to. That's due to the shape, the distortion here. It's not a perfect. Uh, perfect mass, it has um, a distribution, so you get several copies. Uh, Why do we see something in the middle? You don't see the thing in the middle because there's no line that goes in a straight line, because any line that went in a straight line would get so distorted by that that the light from it would disappear. So you don't actually see the object where it is. You only see images of it in different places. It's, it's called gravitational lensing. It's like a lens. It moves things around. But it also distorts them. And as I say, we know that they're exactly the same uh, galaxy because the light from these galaxies arrives at Earth. There's, there's a signal that comes from these galaxies. And you measure the signal and you can see that they're arriving. But they're arriving at different times. Okay? So, this is telling us that uh, R now would have four different times 
if you like, our time. Uh, so this is our, us. I can't even spell us. God. <laughs> and here we have G2237. And this is the now time for us. But it gets so distorted, there's one going there, and then there's another part of the now time for us, which also gets distorted, and that's going to arrive there, and so on. You get four copies. As we go back to our original question, which one is the one that God's going to choose to be his now time? Uh, as I said, why don't we get a ring? Well, sometimes this object in the middle is, has a distribution, uh, so you don't get a nice ring. But sometimes it's, it's a very, because it's a black hole, it's, uh, it's very nicely spherically symmetric and you can get these beautiful rings. Uh, so here's another image I found from NASA. So that's a theist problem. Okay, well, clearly the solution is to go and say, no, I'm not going to be a theist any longer, I'm going to be a deist. I'm going to believe that God created uh, the entire universe. Um, knows the future and the past. Uh, so here we have God. Okay, not really God. Um, <laughs> gazing, <laughs> gazing upon the universe in much the same way as you all gazed upon my space-time diagrams. Okay, but now we have a problem. Now the future is fixed, as is the past. The entire universe is just presented as a single entity. So, us living in the universe, well, we can pray to God for comfort, but we can no more pray to God to change uh, for something in the future uh, than we can pray to God to change something in the past. So, you know, it's obviously difficult, you're with your uh, dying cat, and you decide you're going to pray you could, you normally would pray that the cat gets better, but you might as well pray that the cat never got ill, because it's the same to God. The present and future are all combined into a single, uh, single space time. Such a God would have to live in a higher dimension. Uh, we know that this is four dimensional. I know we've drawn it as a two dimensional sketch. But you imagine that that's four dimension, and then you come out another <coughs> dimension. So we've got at least a, fi uh, a five dimension. Then we can ask, is God dynamic? Does God change his mind? Does God live in his own time? Well, if God lived in his own time, that would require six dimensions. The four dimensions of space-time, plus one more dimension for God to live in, so he's living in a five dimension, plus God's own time could be six-dimensional. That's fine. God could live in any number of dimensions he wishes to. And in such a, an idea, you know I told you that praying wouldn't make a difference and God wouldn't be able to perform a miracle. But actually God could perform a miracle. He could look at his space-time, could look at his universe and decide that it wasn't quite as perfect as he wanted it to be. He would like someone to be resurrected. So he looks and he says, ah, there's Jerusalem 33 AD, and I want to perform a little miracle at that point. I'll just change that point there. And the effect of that miracle would spread out at the speed of light. Okay? It couldn't affect these points, okay? but it could affect this red triangle here. But this is quite amusing, because <coughs> any effect, especially a miracle, would completely change the space-time diagram. So now there'd be two universes. One where he performed the miracle, and one where he didn't. And people who grew up in the universe where he didn't perform a miracle, they would never know about the miracle. There'd be lives... Uh, they will have children, they might have more children than the people who grew up in the other universe, or vice versa. So there'll be lives that exist in one universe that don't exist in the other. So, 
really, you should think of that as two separate universes. One where the miracle is performed, one where the miracle isn't performed. I think I'd just see that as an event. That just like any event that happens in the universe, that has to spread out to speed of light and nothing, that, nothing outside of the light can be affected. Well, that, that is what it is. But now you can think that you have two copies, one with this miracle and one without this miracle. And the lies in one and the lies in the other. So they would be different. Of course, you don't have to take on board. You could say, okay, God having created the miracle then completely destroys the other universe that never existed at all. Okay, and then it wouldn't be a problem. But the way I'd like to think of it is more of like a multi universe. That there's lots of different universes that God could create. Here, God has finally chosen his perfect universe with just the right number of miracles. But unfortunately, in the attempt, he's created all these different universes which have different miracles. And then, of course, we can ask the question, how do we know we're not living in one of these? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, yes. You're working on the assumption that the miracle is an event. In the same way that your birth was an event, does that mean that for every single individual event, a new universe is created? No, because my event, the event of my birth, was generated by all the events that led up to it. And it's not a miracle working in the same way? No, because a miracle is a suspension of the laws of physics. It's it's an active intervention. There's no way you could predict a miracle happened. God knows about it, yes. Yeah. But he could have built everything coming up to it before. But then it wouldn't be a miracle. It would be our right, but that depends on the definition of miracle. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's, that's completely valid. As far as I'm concerned, a miracle is a suspension of the laws of physics. So there is no way of predicting it. Um, and therefore, it actually requires an active intervention. I mean, if you took, say, the, the Joshua miracle, there's no way that that could have been predicted because that's an active suspension of the laws of physics. Of course, of all these problems, you have the ad infinitum problem. Uh, God, of course, could be creating, but there could be a God's God and a God's God's God, and you always have this, this, this problem. Anyway, in summary, Theseus, who talk about God and time, usually assume a Newtonian point of view. Certainly everyone I've spoken to um, who, who thinks about these things always assumes that God, uh, God's time is the same as everybody's time and therefore can uh, create a miracle uh, in their own time. My suspicion is that most of them just simply haven't been exposed to special relativity, and therefore special relativity should be taught at schools to six-year-olds. Um, <laughs> perhaps overkill. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are theologians who are also physicists, um, uh, quite famous ones like Hawking Horn and Hawking Horn and Davies and, and so on. And yet they don't seem to address this problem. Even though they've got sufficient background that they should be able to. Um, so we've known this has been the case, uh, has not been the case for, for at least a hundred years. Uh, the idea, the question of whether God is in time or out of time is a very old one. It dates back um, to, to the, the, the church fathers and Augustine and so on. Uh, but this has also been a problem. And so perhaps the solution is that God alone knows the answer. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>